Hello guys, Winston here. Way back in November, when I visited my podcast co-host Eddie Kramer on my way across the country, I figured we should machine something together. And since it's Eddie we're talking about here, there was no way we were cutting something out of wood. Only metal would suffice. So I tried to come up with a suitable project to undertake. Eddie does a lot more metal work than I do, so I wanted to pick up some tips from him on how best to machine aluminum on a small machine like the Nomad. I also wanted to play with 3D tool pathing options to achieve an aesthetically interesting finish. Because of that, I needed a 3D geometry that would be easy to segment. Since I'd be in Texas, I thought Lone Star. To create this model, I sketched out one point of a star in 2D, extruded it upwards, created angle cuts, and duplicated it around an axis four more times in 72 degree increments. With a 3D star shape modeled up in Fusion, I had Eddie dig through some of his old aluminum machining recipes, apply some appropriate feeds and speeds for pocket clearing aluminum with an eighth inch end mill, and added a parallel toolpath perpendicular to each point on the star. In watching Eddie work, I started to think about two things I hadn't given much thought to before, smoothing and feed optimization. Smoothing can be thought of as a filter or compression algorithm for G-code. It attempts to replace small sequences of linear moves with arc equivalents. If you've ever seen a CNC stutter or unexpectedly slowing down when it's rounding a corner, it's probably because your G-code sender is overloading the machine's buffer with commands for tiny linear movements. Not only does this result in longer machining time than expected, but it can also cause inconsistent surface finish. Smoothing can help fix this, so there's not much reason not to turn it on. One thing to note is that smoothing only works in planar movements, so toolpaths that move in all three axes simultaneously will not benefit from smoothing. I'm looking at you, Morphed Spiral. Feed optimization is a feature that slows down the machine when it approaches an internal corner. These corners are annoying particularly in pocketing and partial width of cut contours because they cause spikes in material engagement and I'm sure you've heard it. Those chirps and vibrations when your cutter hits a corner can be mitigated by reducing your feed rate and thus chip load. I rarely use this because I would rather use an adaptive clear from my pockets, but when you're doing a contour finishing pass with a small end mill, I'll sometimes turn this on. It's just a little extra insurance to prolong tool life. With our cam setup, we got to work on the Nomad with some aluminum stock. For the sake of time, we'd opted to use a 3D pocketing toolpath to rough everything out. The calculation time is really short and you don't need much margin to slot around your geometry. It may not have been as optimal and it was noisy as hell, but it maximized the material removal rate and it was a good quick and dirty way to attack the problem. When it came time to change tools, Eddie forgot to set tool numbers for the different end mills in Fusion. The tool number is how Carbide Motion knows to pause and prompt you for a tool change. If all the tools have the same numerical identifier, Carbide Motion won't stop. On our first star test, instead of stopping to let us swap in a 1 16th inch end mill for contouring, the Nomad decided to crash an 8th inch end mill straight into the part. The next time around, we fixed the tool numbers and marched through the operations. The parallel toolpath took a while, but it ran without any issues. However, there were a couple things about the finished part I wasn't thrilled with. Eddie likes to cut things close, in the literal sense. On our roughing operations, he left just a couple thou of stock to leave. The magnitude of tool and machine deflection during our pocket clearing was greater than the stock to leave margin, so even after running over everything with a ball end mill, we could still see some really subtle waterline marks in the aluminum from the roughing operation. The final surface finish also wasn't as smooth as I would have liked. I didn't expect a mirror finish, but the satin finish we ended up with was a little disappointing. This did not please me, so when I got to Los Angeles, I decided to try again. This time, since I wasn't rushed, I could take the time to work out an adaptive recipe that I liked. Here I'm using a 2mm single flute end mill and I worked out some aggressive feeds and speeds for roughing. 30 inches per minute, 10 thou optimal load, 30 thou depth of cut. To speed up the adaptive, I cranked up the non-engagement feed rate to the Nomad's max of 100 inches per minute technically 102. I would be leaving 15,000 stock to leave here, being super generous to avoid the surface finish issues seen in San Antonio. As expected, the roughing operation went off without a hitch, but when it came time to finishing, I loaded up a ball end mill and hit run, and I immediately broke the end mill. When I'd done this at Ed's place, we'd use much less stock to leave. This time, with more generous stock to leave, the 132nd inch end mill had to push through a lot more material. Too much material, it turns out. 15 thou is almost half the diameter of the cutter. So I added a parallel finishing toolpath using the larger end mill in a few thou stock to leave. 
This preliminary finishing pass would help thin out what the 132nd inch ball end mill would have to contend with later. This time I ran through the toolpaths without quite so much drama and was initially pleased with what I saw, but upon closer inspection things didn't look nearly as smooth as I hoped they would be. You could feel the surface texture on the part if you ran your fingernail over it. Was this an artifact of machine accuracy, spindle tolerance, the low surface speed of a 132nd inch ball end mill on a 10k RPM spindle, unoptimized step over? I wasn't sure, but I was triggered. I wanted more from my desktop class CNC, even if almost no one would fault this surface finish from a machine with a low four-figure price tag. But through the power of science, I resolved to figure out just how much better I could get things. And to summarize hours and hours of testing, I first started by running some stars where each point was a different step over, and one of the stars would have air blast on it just to see if chip recutting was an issue. Turns out, with such small chips, there wasn't much for air blast to improve on. But looking at step over as a variable, I found that about a 5% step over was a good middle ground between machining time and surface quality. Testing a 5% step over across a variety of finishing strategies, I came to the conclusion that the shallow faceted geometry I had was best tackled with a 3D scallop toolpath. Which I guess shouldn't be a surprise because that's kind of what they recommend for it in the description. It narrowly edged out morph spiral for the best looking part. Parallel actually turned out to be the worst because in one direction of the parallel finish it left a really rough texture. I think following the gradient of shallow slopes with a ball end mill is a bad idea in general because you force the cutter to do a lot of work with the zero SFM tip. Combined with the gumminess of 6061 aluminum, it sort of just swirled material around leaving an almost sandpaper-like finish. The best toolpaths all spent the majority of their time moving laterally. At some point in the future, I'll have to retry this experiment in some 7075 aluminum and or brass. So in conclusion, if you want a quick rough finish, go with a step over of between 7-10%, to use 6% for a high quality finish, and 3% or less if you have a lot of time to kill. But any step over that's significantly smaller than your chip load is probably a waste of your time. So there you have it, 3 months and 2000 miles later, I finally have some guidelines for making good looking 3D parts in aluminum on the Nomad. I hope you guys got something useful out of this video, it's really just a recap of things I learned and a look at my process for experimentation. Thank you all very much for watching, and I'll hopefully be able to get back to a more regular video upload schedule soon.